In 1951, Australia celebrated its 50th anniversary as the still less than a decade old Liberal Party, led by two-time Prime Minister Robert Menzies, attempted to win a second term in government against the Labor Party still under the leadership of Ben Shifley, who, despite suffering health problems, was determined to win back the role of Prime Minister. Since 1949, the Cold War between the East and the West had only heated up. In August 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested their first atomic bomb, and by 1951, both they and the United States had begun to build up huge stockpiles of nuclear weapons for an inevitable conflict. Meanwhile, at home, the recently elected second-time Prime Minister Robert Menzies and his new Liberal Party were determined to make Australia an example of a functioning liberal democracy, to contrast the growing communist influence in the region. Menzies would continue to work on the large infrastructure projects of the previous government, such as the Snowy Hydro Scheme. However, he would downgrade the scope of other projects to balance out the budget, removing the need for the monetary nationalisation plans of Labor. Menzies would also follow his campaign promise and end the remaining wartime rationing policy. During the Menzies government, the first cracks in the White Australia policy began to form. The first of these quote cracks was the opening of Australia's borders to a handful of non-European war refugees. Another would occur in 1950 with the Colombo Plan, which allowed students from Asian countries to study in Australia. Despite these changes to immigration, Menzies remained a supporter of the White Australia policy, claiming that he had kept Australia free of the racial conflicts seen in other countries. Do you believe that the, white, the so-called White Australia policy will always be a stumbling block? I don't think it's such a stumbling block as people pretend, but that it's important for us, I haven't the slightest doubt that we should maintain it the way it is? As long as we possibly can, we ought to aim at having a homogeneous population. I don't want to see reproduced in Australia the kind of problem they have in South Africa, or in America, or increasingly in Great Britain. I think we, it's been a very good policy, and it's been of great value to us. Menzies would suffer a case of deja vu when his short prime ministership would yet again be called into another war this time over the Korean Peninsula. On the 25th of June 1950, the Communist-backed forces of North Korea crossed the 38th parallel and attacked the US-backed forces of South Korea. Determined to stop the spread of communism, US President Harry S. Truman would declare war on North Korea and moved forces to assist South Korea, who were being overwhelmed by their better armed enemy. Menzies would also send over a thousand troops to assist the Americans, as well as other Allied forces, in pushing the North Koreans back, and by November that year, they had not only kicked North Korean forces out of South Korea, they had also pushed into enemy territory and now controlled almost the entire Korean Peninsula. This prompted the still infant People's Republic of China to get involved, and by December, over a million Chinese soldiers had flooded into the peninsula and had pushed the Allied forces back to the 38th parallel, and by 1951, the war had turned into a stalemate with neither side advancing. Unable to stamp out communism in Korea, Menzies would instead attempt to stamp out communism back at home. For the past two years, Menzies had struggled to pass legislation due to the Labour majority in the Senate, and thus desired a double dissolution election. A double dissolution election, if you remember, is an election where the entire Senate is up for election, as opposed to the usual half. Such an election had not been called since 1914. To call a double dissolution, Menzies needed the Senate to reject a bill twice. He hoped to achieve this with the bill that would ban the Australian Communist Party from running in any future elections. Menzies had hoped that Labor, under former Prime Minister Ben Shifley, would block the bill, but to his surprise, after a redraft, Shifley let the bill pass. This bill would later be thrown out by the Supreme Court for being unconstitutional. Despite his Communist ban being unsuccessful in both banning the ACP and forcing a double dissolution, Menzies would get his desired double dissolution with the failed passage of the Commonwealth Banking Bill a few months later. And thus, with the Korean War as a backdrop, the election would be called for the 28th of April 1951. This would be the first election in Australian history where the same two party leaders went off against each other three times in a row. And the winner was... Robert Menzies with 69 seats, a loss of five, which really didn't matter because he still controlled the lower house, and with a six seat swing in his favour he now had control of the Senate. Labour had won five seats, but the loss of the Senate meant Labour no longer held any sway over government policies. Since 1951, Labour has never held a Senate majority. Despite the election defeat, the biggest loss for Labour would come less than two months later, with the untimely death of Ben Shifley, who suffered a heart attack in a similar manner to his predecessor John Curtin. He was rushed to hospital but would die in transit. 
This is the almost completely bedridden James Scullin and seven-day Prime Minister Frank Ford as the only living former Labour Prime Ministers, not including the 89-year-old Billy Hughes, who the 1951 election would be the last one he partook in. He would pass away the following year, becoming the second last member of the original 1901 government to pass away, with former Labour member King O'Malley passing away 14 months later. Australia has moved into a new era, the old guard is gone, and more elections await as you move further into the 50s. Come back next time for the election of 1954.